Um, all right, so uh, I'm Mark. I'm from a little research institute uh, called ICSI, the International Computer Science Institute. We're actually in Berkeley, um, down the hill from where BSD was invented. And uh, my group actually did the tool that Mick mentioned, Bro. Um, so we do all kinds of things. <laughs> and one of the things we do is, is DNS. So that's what I'm supposed to talk about. But I couldn't help uh, inserting a slide while Mick was talking. Um, a DNS thing that we've observed recently. I made this plot uh, the, the other day. We, we did a bunch of work where we lit up a DNS zone and uh, then sort of probed it from all over the place. And it's been years since we've used this DNS zone. Um, and yet, this is uh, what probably about 11 months of data here. Um, we still get hits on this DNS zone every single day. Right, so this is days since May 8th of last year. This is a cheap plot. Range from somewhere in the hundreds to somewhere over 10 million every day. All right, so this is what happens when you watch the sewer of the internet, right? <laughs> Which we do every single day in my group, right? So um, you, can, you can see all this stuff, this is zombies. Um, Okay, that's not what I wanted to talk about, but I thought it was too fun to share after after mixed stuff. Yeah. How did you We we just registered a, a, a yeah a DNSresearch.us grad student of mine registered that for a while. We ran an authoritative server for that domain, and we actually probed it ourselves in various ways from lots of places. Um, I could give you. DNS plots for days and days. Um, but we haven't used it in a couple years, but we happen to notice that we're still getting this chud every single day. Um, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about. Um, but our group does lots of other things, so I also wanted to give another shameless plug that isn't really what I wanted to talk about. We have this new um, Android application that we're looking for help um, with. Uh, it's called Haystack. Uh, there's the URL. Um, and the idea is we're building a, a little measurement platform on um, mobile devices. And the first thing we're doing is we're trying to um, go after privacy leaks. So all these applications that you, you install are doing all sorts of things behind your back to track you, to exfiltrate your contact list, your um, list of installed apps, all kinds of things. So this app will show you some of what's going on. We're in completely early days. So if you install this and try this, that would be great help to us. But it also might be pretty illuminating to you to see what kind of crap your phone is doing. Have you, have you heard of Privacy Guard? Yeah. OK, that's somewhat, I mean, obviously that's just like the, the reports. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so this is early days, and we don't have a lot of data yet. So I don't I know mean, exactly. To see how yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how well they do, right? So lots of people have lots of different techniques. We have something fairly novel to get this, um, which I can talk about some other time. Um, how much what? What data are you taking from what we put on? Ah, so that's all on here, too. So there's this like conundrum, right? You can't do privacy research without <laughs> violating everybody's <laughs> privacy, right? So um, we tell you what we take. Um, and it's mostly just counts and stuff. We don't exfiltrate your, uh, you know, your phone number or your name or your contacts or anything. We're mostly looking for counts. You know, this or, or this application sent this out. Or you know, this this sort of big picture thing. Um, so okay, so there's that. So that brings me back to this again, and I'll really start this time. Um, one of the things we've been doing recently, uh, the last few years, is sort of um, thinking about IPv6, the adoption of IPv6. Um, we're working right now on uh, understanding carrier-grade NATs that people are trying to use to avoid IPv6. This is about um, security policy in IPv6. Uh, working with a few other folks um, on this, and there's a paper here that was presented a couple months ago um, this is part of the lead author here, Jake. He's a PhD student until a couple weeks ago when he defended at, at Michigan. 
Uh, Michigan sucks, but he's good. Um, <laughs> I tell him that all the time. Um, don't worry. Uh, so we're going to talk about security in sort of the IPv6 world. And uh, first I want to start by talking about the sort of state of IPv6, regardless of security, for just a second, um, just to sort of motivate things. Um, this is a plot from a paper we wrote a couple years ago. And you don't have to really understand a lot about this plot, but this is looking at IPv6 adoption using a bunch of different sort of uh, metrics, whether they're uh, address allocation, advertisement in the routing tables, actual usage, whatever. And the point of this plot is sort of the lines are going up and to the right. And that means IPv6 is sort of getting adopted. Okay, this is a five-year time span on the x-axis. Um, a plot that goes around that you might be more familiar with, this is the Google, uh, Google's view of IPv6 adoption. So um, what this says is somewhere between 10 and 11 percent of the clients, Google thinks are, of them as IPv6 ready. That means the client can speak IPv6, and the path between that client and Google can also speak IPv6. And so since IPv6 is sort of gaining a little traction, we see things like this. This ad caught our attention. Um, operator training seminar ads, right? So this one sort of caught our attention. And these things are great. Um, not always accurate. But, you know, the question here, why IPv6? And, you know, the first one I sort of agree with here, it's inevitability, right? And I just showed you a couple plots that say, you know, yeah, you know, IPv6 is coming, so network operators should probably be, you know, cognizant of it, logging it, you know, whatever. Um, the, the next one that sort of caught my eye is this one here, improved security. And, you know, so IPv6 gives you improved security. Um, I don't think so. Um, I actually think that IPv4 and IPv6 are about the same in security. Right? These are just network protocols. And they pass packets from one side of the network to the other side of the network. And they're roughly, in my opinion, the protocols themselves are pretty, pretty similar. But I think that aside from the protocol, there's sort of this ecosystem around IPv6, and that is, in fact, less secure, not more secure, less secure than IPv4's sort of ecosystem. And I think this for two reasons. First one is that IPv6 just has this sort of lack of maturity about it, right? Um, we don't understand it. We don't have it in our head. We don't have the mental context. We don't have the tools. We don't have the logging. We don't have the processes in place that we do for IPv4. It's nobody's fault. It's just newer, if a 20-year-old protocol can be newer. Um, <laughs> but, you know, actually using the damn thing is newer. And so um, this will diminish over time. The second one I'm not so sure of, right? The way we run IPv6 is we use dual stacks. Because IPv4 isn't going to go away. It can't go away. You can't do everything with IPv6. And so now, once we introduce IPv6, and we already have IPv4, we have sort of two paths that one can attack. So I have a cartoon here that shows this. Um, my laptop trying to get to Case's web server down here. And the usual way we think about doing this is we make a DNS request, right? We look up an A record in the DNS. We get an IPv4 address. And that sends some packets. It traverses some routers, maybe a firewall down there some path between these two machines, right? So we can do the same thing with IPv6, but instead of looking up that A record in the DNS, we look up a quad A record. Get an IPv6 address, we do the same thing, right? So we get this other path through the network. So now we have sort of two paths through the network to do the same job. It sort of depends on um, which network protocol you, you use. And it might be two separate physical paths, or you know, we have this firewall over here at Case. Um, there's sort of two virtual paths through there. You're not tickling exactly the same code when you go through with IPv6 as you are with IPv4, right? And so if you want to present sort of the same security posture, you have to make the red path and the blue path agree. If they don't agree, you don't have the same security posture. All right, so hopefully I've just convinced you of this one very simple point, right? The red path and the blue path are different. 
So security policies can be different. All right, that's easy. There's this um, internet draft from the IETF right now that says this. In new IPv6 deployments, it has been common to see IPv6 traffic enabled, but none of the typical access control mechanisms enabled for IPv6 device access. This is just sort of evidence. We've talked to other people. We know this sort of an anecdote here that says the red path and the blue path are, in fact, different. Okay. So I told you that it can happen. And now we know by anecdote that, it, in fact, it does happen sometimes. Um, I find it really trippy that I can see myself when I'm talking. <laughs> I don't like that. Um, yeah, right. Then I can't you know, forget it. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a new twist to giving a talk. So, um, so this isn't good enough for us, right? So um, the, the folks who, who did this study, you know, we're, we're sort of all empiricalists. We're all measurement guys. We love digging into logs, and we love to you know, look at data. And this isn't good enough. We don't like to reason by anecdote. We like to understand how things look in the wild and broadly in the wild, OK? So we want to understand what the network looks like here. Forget your anecdotes. And so we decided we'd do a measurement study. And this is an overview of our methodology, which is a pretty straightforward um, measurement study methodology. First thing we need is a list of dual stack hosts. Okay? One host speaks both v4 and v6. We need a whole list of those things. Um, the bigger, the better. Um, second step, probe these dual stack hosts with both IPv4 and IPv6. And the third step is take all that data and try to make some sense out of it, get some insights out of it. First problem, we have to find dual stack hosts. And there's not some big website you go to and find a list of dual stack hosts, so we had to sort of invent these lists. And so what we did was we went off and we found lists of hosts labeled by IP address, IPv4 address, IPv6 address, host name, whatever we could sort of cotton on to is sort of our starting point. Um, and so, you know, I have an example here. Let's just say we start with a host name. You know, that's a label for a host. Okay. Now we want to see if that's a dual stack host. So the first thing we do is we look up an A record in the DNS for that name. Okay, now we have two IP addresses, two IPv4 addresses for that host. Okay, well, the next thing is obvious. We look up the quad A record. Aha, now we have an IPv6 address. Now we have four labels for this host. Okay, we have two IPv4 addresses. We have an IPv6 address. We have a host name. All the same host, right? No. Um, so there's been studies done. One of my pals, uh, Naval Postgraduate School, Rob Beverly, did this study that says this is not necessarily the same host. There's nothing in the DNS that says this is the same host. It's just we have all these addresses mapping to one name, right? Even in the IPv4 space, even if you get rid of IPv6 from it, even in the IPv4 space, it's mapping us to two different hosts, maybe. Or maybe those are on the same host. We don't know. Um, so we had to go to some amount of effort here to make sure that these things that we found that we think are dual stack hosts are really dual stack hosts. And so we went through this calibration phase. Um, and I'm not going to explain this um, in, in any great detail. I'm going to give you an example to sort of fuel your intuition. And if you really, really care, you can go read the paper. Um, so all these labels point to one host. So what we did was we said, well, let's see if we can get to the SSH port via both v4 and v6. And if we can, great. We'll go connect to the SSH port, and we'll snarf out the host key. If those two host keys match, we have pretty high confidence that we're talking to the same machine. All right? We do lots of things like that. So even if the SSH ports aren't available to us, we do other things. And um, I should also note that all these hosts that we found, all these dual stack hosts we found, we actually verified that in some way they speak both v4 and v6. So this is not some artifact of the DNS where somebody put in a quad A record 
but didn't actually light up v6 on their network or on their device. And so we ended up with sort of two lists of hosts, 25K routers around the internet, and over half a million servers. And so once we have these lists, we probe them. Obviously, we're going to probe the host by both v4 and v6. Um, we use a tool called Scamper, which is a nice probing tool. Matthew Lucky is co-author on this. He, it's his tool, and he wrote a bunch of new modules to let us do this um, easily. Um, we sent two kinds of probes in this study, a basic probe and a traceroute style probe. So a basic probe, you think of this as a SYN. So if I want to probe the BGP port on a router, I send it a SYN, and I see what comes back. Um, and we have a traceroute style probing, which is the same thing. We send that same SYN out, but we send it with TTL1, TTL2, TTL3, just like traceroute works, to try to understand um, if we see weird things, where they might be happening along the path. Okay. And we probed a bunch of different ports. Okay. We sort of two sets of ports, one for the routers, one for the servers, sort of based on what, we, what services we thought each would be, would be running. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. When you're doing those probes. Yes. just the IP addresses. Okay. We're not looking for anything around there. Okay. Um, I should say we tried to do the probing in a, the most sort of benign way possible, very low rate, kind of spread them out randomly. Um, we didn't want to throw off anybody's you know, uh, port mapping alerts or anything. So, um, so just the IP addresses. So based on the results, then we try to detect policy. So these are ladder plots. Time goes down the slide here. Um, one for v4, one for v6. I'm sure you guys have all seen these in wherever. Um, but they work like this. So um, let's say the client sends the IPv4 address a SYN. Okay? So the server might respond with a SYN ACK. Now we know we can establish a TCP connection with that particular server. You could send the same SYN with, to the IPv6 address. And you know, maybe we get the same result back, we get an, a SYNAC back. Okay? In this case, we say, okay, well, we found a uniform policy across v4 and v6. They act the same. Okay? And in this case, that port is open. Um, if we get this case where we send a SYN and we get a reset back from both, we say, okay, well, the policy is still uniform. Both are acting in the same fashion. But now the service is blocked. You know, somebody's telling us to go away. Um, this isn't the only way to tell us to go away, but this is an example. <laughs> and then this is the, the, the one where there's actually a policy difference. Right? So with IPv4, we send our SYN, we get a reset back. It says, no, go away. With IPv6, we send our SYN, we get a SYN ACK back. It says, sure, I'll talk to you. Right? And this is the back door from the title of the talk. Right? IPv4 go away. IPv6, come on in. Okay. So we want to know how often this kind of thing happens. So results, I've got plots. Um, I, I assume you, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I assume you uh, look at the, the reverse case at all. Maybe. If what? Uh, anomaly, uh, the policy difference on the IPv6 range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so let, me, let me explain this for just a minute and you, you'll see. Yeah, we did. Um, the, those three things are just examples. We see actually different, different things here. So this is a whole plot that I'm only showing you a little bit of so I can teach you how to read this plot for a minute. Um, this is router, our router results. So we probed 25,000 routers. Um, and let me see here. Oh, yeah. This blue area on the plot represents the, the percentage of routers that would answer us on both protocols, IPv4, IPv6, they're open. They're both open. And so, you know, what is that, 4% or something? Okay. This green area arrow is what you were talking about. This is the case where IPv4 would answer our query, would let us establish a connection with the BGP port, but IPv6 would say, no way. Okay. 
That's a little tiny sliver. Um, this is the back door. Right? This is just the opposite. This is where IPv4 said, nope, go away. And IPv6 said, sure, come on in. Okay? We'll talk to you. And so the number over here on the right is 73%. It's 73% more routers are accessible when we use IPv6 than when we use IPv4 on the BGP port. All right? So then here's the whole plot. <laughs> now, you have to ignore NTP at the top because it's crazy and I can't explain it. <laughs> it, it has very little common policy, but you know, sort of we can get at it with V6 and V4, but distinctly somehow. I don't know. But what this says, what this plot says to me is we don't have much green, okay? In other words, we don't have many cases that you were talking about where V4 is open and V6 is closed. So let's just forget that. But we have a bunch of red. All right. This is the back door. This is the V6 back door. And in fact, these are some pretty big relative numbers here. All right. A lot of increased openness. And the protocols that I circled here are protocols that network operators use to run routers a whole lot. And routers run the internet, so this is bad news. Should we be doing any further analysis? Like, I gravitate right away to SNMP. Yeah. If somebody's making that mistake on SNMP, are they using like the fault string, like for their team? Oh yeah, yeah. That's how we. That's how we got it. We used yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. 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 On the internet. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, the internet's full of shit, man. You know that. I mean, you know. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 So maybe I can make you feel a little better here. This is the plot for the servers. Um, and here we see a little more uniformity. Again, we see not too much green. Um, but in this case, we don't see quite as much red for servers. Okay, so this back door isn't quite as prevalent um, in, in this case. There, there's one exception here, which is HTTPS, where we see 40% more machines open to IPv6 probing than IPv4. Um, so next we sort of wondered, well, how, is this, how are these policies being enforced? Okay, if somebody's trying to block us, how are they doing it? And is there a difference between v4 and v6? So we sort of we, we, we separated this into sort of two ways policies are enforced, how and where. So the first one here is how. how are blocking decisions being enacted. The first one is passive. Something comes in, you don't like it, you just throw it away. Okay? And the other one is active. Something comes in, you don't like it, you send some kind of error back. Might be an unreachable, might be a reset. You send something back that says no. All right? You don't just silently ignore it. So that's the how. And then there's the where. And we split this up into two again. <laughs> We call the target the destination of the probe, the IP address we put in the probe and we're sending it to. That is the thing doing the policy. It's saying no. Okay. And the other category being something before our packets get all the way to that destination um, is enacting the policy. So there's an in-network in firewall, IPS, something. Okay. So, um, just have a couple of quick results. There's a bunch of numbers here, but there's sort of two high order bits here. This is the routers, okay? And we see that V6 uses more active blocking than V4. V4 is more likely to just throw away your stuff. V6 is more likely to give you an error, okay? And for the routers, the target host, the target router in this case, is responsible for, for more blocking in IPv4. In V6, we see more in-network stuff, firewalls or, or whatnot, okay, for, for V4 to protect things. So we can switch over to the servers here. Um, the first bullet is the same. Again, we see that V6 is more likely to send you an error back um, than V4. V4, more likely to just throw your stuff away. But here, the policy enforcement is sort of more equally shared between something in the network like an IPS and the actual end host. Okay. Um, so, all right, we, we, ha we got all these results and there's actually m many more. Um, I was trying to sort of keep things high level here. There's 
uh, some more digging if you want to get into the paper. But we had all these results, and we were going to write a paper. We did write a paper, and we decided maybe we should know if we were correct or not um, because we made some sort of assumptions along the way. Um, and one of our assumptions is this is not an intentional thing. We find these policy discrepancies. It's not intentional. It's a bug. It's a misconfiguration. It's because V6 is immature. Okay. So we decided that maybe we could validate this to some degree by asking some of our friends a few questions. So we put together some emails to 16 of our friends that we know at network operators. And um, different kinds of places, um, uh, different, ki different sizes of ISPs, universities, whatever. And we told them, here's what we found out about your network. And we wanted to know sort of three things. And we know these people, right? So uh, we, we figured they weren't going to get too pissed off at us. We wanted to know, did we find dual stack hosts correctly? Um, did we detect policy differences correctly? And then the third thing is, was, that, was, was this policy difference, was that intentional? All right? We can't imagine why it might be intentional, right? But it would be nice to know if it was. And so what we found is that 12 of them answered us. So four of them weren't as good of friends as we thought. <laughs> but they all confirmed our results. They all said, sure, you found dual stack hosts. Those hosts you found, that's one host has two addresses, you found the dual stack host. And sure enough, you're showing us a policy discrepancy between v4 and v6. And the other thing that 12 of them all said was, oops, they all indicated this was unintentional. Right? They did not want this to happen, and then they went off and fixed it. Okay? So this is only 12. Right? We identified policy dis discrepancies at a zillion places. All right? So this is 12. This is not statistically significant or anything. But this is an indication that what we show is probably a problem. And to Jake's credit, Jake, after the final paper was done and turned in, but before it was presented, he notified everybody that we found a policy discrepancy. And that's a zillion people, and that's a hard job to find contact information everywhere. Um, it was a hell of a lot of work. He, he notified everybody. Um, so, so that's sort of mostly what I wanted to say. Um, there's sort of a final bit here, which is, you know, sort of the same bit we heard before. Watch your logs, okay? This is the tip of the iceberg. We think that ACLs, which is what we looked at, is the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of other things that are likely different between V4 and V6, whether that's your intrusion detection systems configuration, whether that's your logging, what you're logging, how you're looking for things. Um, there's lots of things, so it's, you know, it's time to be vigilant. It's, you know, it's going back to fundamentals here. Okay? You have to be vigilant about this stuff um, because I don't think ACLs are the end of the story. And uh, that's all I had to say and then some, I think. So, questions? Yeah, so that's, that's always the question in a study like this. And um, all it requires, all it requires is another student. <laughs> yeah. um, no, so I love longitudinal data. I love to be able to you know, start drawing trends. So yeah, I would love to do it. And especially I would love to do it because we did the notifications to everybody. So you know, the fact that that raised awareness Hopefully, that means that you know, the back doors are reduced. So I would absolutely love to do this again. But um, it does take a, a, a bunch of work. And so we, we definitely need somebody to put the elbow grease in. Did you have something? Yeah, this one up here. And the MySQL. Yeah, so the MySQL is really weird, right? Um, I, I, have an, I have a theory about that one, but um, why is that like that? Oh, just an indication that a lot of your websites are blocking the alternative IP core, all the packets, all the 
Um, so it's, it's curious, right? And I can't exactly explain this case, right? Where we see some more, some V4 open that V6 isn't open on, right? I, I can't explain that in some great way other than, you know, maybe they have V6 lit up. We know the hosts speak V6 because we were able to talk to the hosts via V6 in some fashion. But um, maybe it's, a, it's an evolution thing where they just haven't gotten enough confidence in V6 to spin up their actual web server on it or something, and so they're blocking the V6 traffic. I, I'm not sure. Um, it's a sort of a similar story I can construct with my SQL down here is that, you know, people want to be able to query some database for, for whatever reason, um, but they have a general block in for, for V6 or something like that. Um, that's the most striking one, uh, discrepancy in, in the green there. Um, so I don't know. I, I, that doesn't answer your question, I know, but I don't have a fantastic answer here. So. Um, so, yeah, uh, we did, we didn't, well, we collected some of that data in, like, for HTTP or something because we were, do, we were trying to make sure, in, in our calibration of trying to make sure the two hosts were the same. So if we go and find what version of Apache are you running, if you're running two different versions of Apache, well, guess what, that's not a dual stack host, you know. So that was another one of our sort of calibration checks. So we have some of that data. Um, we didn't try to correlate, um, certainly not in the paper, there's no correlation of that. I don't, I don't think we even did it. Um, because we don't, well, yeah, we, I don't think we did it. Yeah. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so we have a whole section on scanning IPv6. As what, what, I have slides here, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I can interpret them. Um, I can try. Uh, these are Jake's slides, and I haven't looked at them. Um, I'm going to try this, but I, I'm going to page it back in at the same time, and I'm old, and it's late, and my pager doesn't work very well. Um, but. We had this whole list of IPv6 addresses that are used in production. And what we found is that, you know what, if you want to scan IPv6, you don't have to scan the whole damn thing because the addresses are, that are in use are concentrated. And that's what this is showing. There's ranges of these things. And if you can just scan these ranges, you can get a lot of bang for your buck. Right? And you can hit a lot of the hosts just with, you know, by knowing something about how, about the structure of IPv6 addresses. Yeah. And somebody told me um, actually earlier this week that there's a paper, um, do you know ZMAP? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we were thinking and sort of just in the talking stages of doing, you know, a ZMAP 6 that sort of leveraged some of this, let you scan IPv6, not completely, but probabilistically. And um, somebody told us, and I, I got this email earlier this week, that maybe we've been beat to that punch and that somebody actually has done that. And uh, I have a paper, I have a draft of a paper, uh, and I haven't read it, but it, this is the way it was advertised to me, that maybe this is actually a tool that you'll be able to get pretty soon. Yeah. But there, so if you, if you go look at the paper, um, there's definitely some strategies one could use in there and the paper is there. Yeah. What else? Anything? Yep. Anything else? Now everybody's tired. All right, good. Thank you.
Oh, you want this.